uh, we welcome you to the May 3rd Governing Body meeting. If you will give your attention to Councilwoman Ortiz, who is on Zoom, she's going to provide our invocation and stand as you are able, and then remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Councilwoman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in Isaiah 11, 6, it says that a child shall leave them. Shall leave them. I have invited Colby Hall. Is he at the podium? Colby and his parents are pastors. Is there a Colby Hall in the audience? Councilwoman, there's no one here identifying as Colby Hall. Okay. Well, maybe we got our, um, okay, so there's nobody there from the High Crest Fellowship, is that correct? Correct. Okay, all right, thank you. I, I will communicate with them. Maybe we got our communication um, tangled up. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, Lord, thanking you for our city, thanking you for our community members, our police officers, Lord, we just thank you in every aspect of life and what you're doing with our city, what you've done, and what you're getting ready to do. And Lord, as we go through this evening, Lord, help us make decisions that are pleasing to you and to our community members. We ask that you touch the homeless. We ask that you touch our emergency personnel. And we ask that you touch each and every person that's represented on the council and their families. And Lord, we just can't thank you enough for all that you've done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll call this meeting to order. And, uh, Madam Clerk, if you will call the roll, please. Mayor Padilla? Here. Council Members Hiller? Here. Valdivia Aqua? Here. Ortiz? Here. Emerson? Here. Kale? Here. Nager? Dun Dobler? And Duncan? Here. And Lesser? Here. We have eight present. Thank you. We have a couple of proclamations this evening. <coughs> Uh, the first one is for National Bike Month, and we have Andy Fry and Felicia Glass join me up here. Let's see, Felicia. Hey, thank you for joining me. It's a proclamation by the mayor. Whereas today millions of Americans engage in bicycling as a suitable form of transportation, an excellent form of commuting, fitness, and for quality family time, and whereas the city of Topeka, Metropolitan Topeka Planning Organization, and Complete Streets Advisory Committee and its community representation promote greater implementation of safe bicycle facilities across the community, public awareness of bicycle operation and safety education, and whereas the MTPO will continue to implement bicycle facilities in all projects and will update Topeka's master plan this year to achieve a future low stress high use network having already completed a total of 73.26 miles of on-street bikeways and an additional 5.45 miles coming in 2023. And whereas Topeka is one of five cities in Kansas with bronze-level bicycle-friendly community status and is also time of year for people to celebrate Bike to Work Week from May 16 to May 22, 2023. And 
whereas Visaline offers an opportunity to invest in a more equitable access to key resources for communities and households without a car, and whereas investing in connected and protected bike lanes and related facilities can be beneficial for local businesses and economic development, and greater support for biking policies, plans, and projects will be an integral part of addressing climate change. Now, therefore, I, Michael A. Padilla, member, Mayor of the City of Topeka, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2022 as National Bike Month and encourage all citizens of Topeka to participate in National Bike Month and ride on a trail or bikeways to work for fun or for a, to a destination to support your, to show your support. In witness thereof, I, Michael A. Padilla of the City of Topeka, Kansas, do hereby affix my official signature and the official seal of the City of Topeka, Kansas on this third day of May, 2022. Andy, that's for you. Would you like to say a few words? <laughs> Um, we just appreciate the city council and the mayor's support uh, and all that the city's done to improve bike accessibility and facilities across town. And uh, we encourage everyone to keep that up. Uh, it's obviously a process and an ongoing one. So uh, we look forward to all the improvements to come. Mr. Fry, what? Mr. Fry, before you go, would you mind introducing these uh, two small beautiful fry. young small, small fry. fries, please? <laughs> so this is Ava Fry, she's five, and this is Anna Fry, and she's three. And then I should also introduce Taylor, she's a multimodal planner, and La Tiffany, she bike rider. Anna <laughs> Walker. Yeah, Anna Walker. Walker. We're all walkers. So. You should see the bike that they rode up on. He had both of the girls in the front. Yeah. It's especially uh, made bike in Denmark, I think it was. It's pretty sharp. And I complimented Andy and that when I saw him, he was doing his hand signals correctly mm -hmm. to make the turn. So wow. he's a safe bike rider. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a second proclamation. And uh, we have two gentlemen in the class to join me up here, uh, Mr. Gilbert Ramirez and Mr. Richard Vasquez. These two, these two gentlemen are part of a committee that has been working for some time through some difficulties, if I might bring up, uh, yeah. to bring uh, into existence a, uh, a memorial at the Our Lady of Guadalupe Church over in Oakland to recognize the veterans and, par and parish members of Our Lady of Guadalupe Church. It also is to recognize all veterans. And uh, so generally, everyone who's had the honor to serve our country, this memorial has been uh, erected. There'll be a dedication later on this week on Thursday. And uh, it's hoped that the uh, governor will also be there to uh, help lay a wreath at this memorial. So in honor of this, I'd like to read this proclamation. Whereas Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, a Veterans Memorial Monument, located on the property of Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, 201 Northeast Chandler Street, Topeka, Kansas, established in 2020 to honor particularly parishioners of the parish of Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, who served in the United States Armed Forces. Reserve and National Guard, and for our country military service in war and peacetime. And whereas all five branches of our nation military have granted written authorization for properly displaying their military seal for public display in accordance with national statutes and regulations. And whereas the OLG Veterans Committee in Topeka have worked with local businesses and constituents to bring forth in this veteran statute the honor, hope, pride, and freedom that we all enjoy. And whereas in Our Lady of Guadalupe Catholic Parish, and in specific recognition, we honor those veterans who served in World War I, 
Rudolf Negrete and Andrew Escabel. Veterans served in World War II, especially remembering the five known prisoners of war, David Carreño, Christy Serna, Penny Rodriguez, Herman Nelmas and Francisco Amaguer, and the two brothers, John Wrangel and his brother, Jose Wrangel, from the U.S. Army who were killed in action, and countless others who served bravely in that war. And whereas, in addition, within our Lady of Guadalupe Parish, we recognize all our military veterans who served and died in other conflicts that our nation has encountered in Korea, especially Corporal Rosendo Perez Cabrera, infantry from the U.S. Army, was killed in action on August 31st, 1950. Likewise, we recognize those veterans Vietnam, Grenada, Panama, Gulf War, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, Afghanistan and Iraqi freedom wars and conflicts. We recognize the many veterans who received their honors with distinguished medals of valor, purple hearts and bronze stars and other veterans who served with valor and distinction and did not receive them. Now, therefore, I, Michael A. Padilla, Mayor of the City of Topeka, Kansas, do proclaim May 5th, 2022, as a dedication to Our Lady of Guadalupe Veterans Memorial Monument. Congratulations, Richard. Thank you, Mayor. And to your committee for all the work you've done, with, uh, Gilbert. You. Here's copies each for you, and would you like to make a, a comment? Thank you, Mayor. Padilla for acknowledging and reading the proclamation. This has been an ongoing endeavor of two years and is dedicated not only to the parishioners at Our Lady Wildlife Parish, but to veterans in general. We have uh, are praying for warm weather <laughs> coming Thursday when the dedication is at one o'clock at Our Lady Wildlife Church here in Topeka, 201 Northeast Chandler. And uh, the mayor will be there. Archbishop Newman from Kansas City, our diocese, will be there as well. And uh, well, Mayor Padilla and uh, so other distinguished guests. So we anticipate her weather, and hopefully many of you will be able to attend as well. Thank you. I'd like to thank the mayor and the city council for this. And I also would like to invite everybody to come and come and do this. I was telling my son, you you we're gonna have a rifle salute, the colors, and I said, you'll never see anything like this in the Oakland Community Church again. I don't think, unless somebody else wants to do it again, <laughs> get another memorial. <laughs> but it, Richard here, he's the spirit man that started it all. It was his dream, and the dream came true. Now it's going to be dedicated on Cinco de Mayo. We picked that day, like he said, it's supposed to be warm, you know. <laughs> but anyway, thank you, yeah. Mayor, Council, and you all welcome to come. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, Gilbert. There's one more thing. There's to be uh, refreshments. At, 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 at the Marlo Cueva Belandrin Center right after the dedication. So we'll hope to see you there. We didn't get the whole story, but if you come to the dedication and be able to visit with the committee members about the trials and tribulations of bringing that monument uh, here to Topeka, the, uh, a lot of the parts were uh, brought from Italy and it took some time to get here, but with COVID and all those other issues and transportation, and then when they got here, the columns that they ordered were broken. So they had to reorder everything again and start from scratch. So it's been a it's been a long time coming, and I applaud them for their effort and sticking with it. So I would invite you to, all of you to attend if you are able. Okay, we will move on uh, to agenda item number three. If the clerk would read, 
Items 3A and B are board appointments recommending the appointment of John Bolander and William Horn to the Noto Business Improvement District Advisory Board to fill a term ending May 2, 2023. Items 3C, D, and E are board appointments recommending the appointment of Pedro Concepcion, Monette Mark, and Thomas Underwood to the Noto Business Improvement District Advisory Board to fill a term ending May 2, 2024. Um, we've heard the... Uh Appointments, is there a motion from the council? Okay. Uh, motion to approve. Appointments? I have a comment when sir. appropriate, sir. Uh -huh. um, I'm just going to say this uh, politely, uh, and this is not an indication of these people. I will probably vote yes tonight because I like all of these people. Um, but I expressed a concern when this bid district was brought to us about the original makeup that it was going to be a majority of individuals who also served on the NOTO board also serving in making up this bid district board. And that appears to be what's happening here tonight. And I just want to put out there that I think, hope in the long term, maybe that can change. I think it, it can set itself up for some conflicts and confusion and, and other issues that could arise when you have one board, members of one board controlling another board that's supposed to be overseeing the whole district. So. I'm going to vote yes tonight because all of these are good people and I know that they will serve it well, but I will just put out there as I did months ago when we had this discussion that moving forward that may not be a best practice. So thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, we have a second. Okay. A motion by Councilman Kell and a second by Councilman Emerson. Uh, if you would call the roll, the roll please. Council Member Siller? Yes. Valdivia Acala? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Kale? Yes. Nager? Yes. So, Duncan? Yes. And Lessa? No. Okay, we have six voting yes and uh, Mr. Lester voting no. So the motion carries. Motion carries. Uh, I had a note here that uh, Mr. Concepcion was going to be here so that we could recognize him, but I don't see him in the in the room. So um, we'll just move on to the the next item on the agenda, uh, the consent agenda. Uh, if the clerk would read, A is an ordinance introduced by interim city manager William E. Cochran, allowing and approving city expenditures for the period of February 26 to March 25, 2022, and enumerating said expenditures therein. B is a resolution introduced by Council Member Christina Valdivia Aquila approving a special event known as the Sacred Heart St. Joseph Parish German Fest 2022. Items C and D are resolutions introduced by Council Member Karen Hiller approving a special event known as the Second Saturday Summer Concert Series and Tap That Topeka. E is a resolution introduced by Council Member Christina Valdivia Aquila granting Sacred Heart St. Joseph Parish an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seat concerning noise prohibitions. Items F and G are resolutions introduced by Council Member Karen Hiller granting the Celtic Fox and the Greater Topeka Partnership an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seat concerning noise prohibitions. H is a resolution introduced by Councilmember Brett Kell granting John Larson an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seat concerning noise prohibitions. I are minutes of the regular meeting of April 19, 2022. There's a list of cereal malt beverage applications sent to you this afternoon and staff is requesting approval. Thank you. We've heard the consent agenda. Uh, is there a motion from the vice? A motion, uh, Councilwoman uh, Ortiz. Are you moving to approve? Okay, you have a motion to approve. Second. A second by Councilman Emerson. If you call the roll, please. Uh, Council members Valdivia Akla? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Emerson? Yes. Kale? Yes. Nager? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Lesser? Yes. Mayor Padilla? Yes. And Hiller? Yes. We have nine yes, motion carries. Yes. Thank you, motion carried. We'll move on to action items, uh, agenda number five. If the clerk would read. 5A is setting a public hearing date of June 7, 2022 for consideration of imposing special assessments for Horseshoe Bend subdivision number five, 
Sherwood, Sherwood Village Subdivision and Misty Harbor Estates Number Five. City Manager, Mayor, Governor Body, this is to set a public hearing date for our uh, special assessment resolution and state law, and looking at to set a, the date as June seventh, twenty twenty-two. Any questions from the City Manager? Having heard the the uh, action item, is there a Motion from the body. To set, this is to just set the public hearing date. Mayor, I move approval. Okay. Motion to approve by Councilman Emerson. Second by Councilwoman Ortiz. You can call the roll, please. Council members Ortiz. Yes. Emerson. Yes. Kale. Yes. Nager? Yes. Duncan? Yes. Lesser? Yes. Mayor Padilla? Yes. Council members Hiller? Yes. And Baldi Viacla? Yes. We have nine yes. Motion carries. Motion having been carried, we'll move to agenda item six, non action items that the clerk would read. 6A is a discussion of an amendment to the City of Topeka 2021 Consolidated Action Plan for the allocation of funding for the Home ARP Implementation Plan. I have someone signed up for uh, public comment on this item. Uh, Mr. Russell Burton. Burton? Is he online? Nothing? Okay. Hey, manager, do you have anything offered? Uh, Mayor, government body, again, this is uh, talking about the consolidation action plan. Mr. Russell. Uh, do you have. Go ahead. Do you have uh, Ms. Corey right here uh, to pre provide information and our consultant uh, as well? So I'd like to call her up at this time. Okay. City Manager, uh, it appears Mr. Burton just entered the room. Would you care for him to go forward before? before? Please. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Burton? You signed up for public comment? Yes, I did. It's um, this, this is time for you to come. I apologize. I am not prepared today. Okay. I'll speak later, but not today. I missed, I missed the comment. I'm sorry. All right. Thank you. Corey. Good evening, everybody. Um, tonight I want to talk about the 2021 to 2025 amended consolidated action plan. Um, just a brief history of this amendment looks a little different than our past amendments. Normally we are amending that exact document that you approved back in July. This time we're taking that approved document, the 2021 to 2025 plan, and attaching the Home ARP implementation plan that we'll be talking about tonight. So in your packet, that document has not been changed. I just put it in there um, just for, for ease and comfort. So. Um, tonight, I would like to uh, introduce Andy Feaster from Development Strategies. He was our consultant on this project, and he will present the Home ARP element, uh, Allocation Plan. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, I'm glad to be here to talk about the Home ARP Allocation Plan. I want to take the next... I'm trying to... Take the next five to six minutes to talk through uh, what we did, what we heard, um, some key takeaways from those conversations and the recommendations for the use of these funds. But before I get into that, I want to give a little bit of background about this program. This is a $2.1 million um, grant from HUD to the city of Topeka. Um, HUD requires that this allocation plan be developed to release the funds to the city so that the city can create the RFP process for applications for this, this um, program. And the allocation plan will specify the focus of the funds and what's eligible. The target populations and goal of this program from HUD is to um, improve housing stability for homeless people, those at risk of homelessness, and uh, specifically those um, in situations of domestic violence that cause housing insecurity. Eligible uses are for the acquisition and production of affordable housing units, rental assistance that keeps people in stable housing situations, services, um, a lot of the different supportive services that a lot of the organizations here provide um, to give uh, individuals more stability and 
and then non-congregate shelter, which is similar to a lot of the homeless shelters you see today, but it has private rooms, so perhaps more like a dorm situation that improves um, security and privacy for individuals and families in that situation. What we did, the, the allocation plan that HUD requires has three components. It's consultations with service providers and housing providers. We do a needs and gaps analysis to determine um, the need for housing units and services. And there's a public comment period. For consultations, um, we and city staff um, talked to and heard from the CAC Homeless Task Force, a lot of the different service providers, housing providers, and we did this with one-on-one -on -one conversations over a six-week period. For the needs and gap analysis, we looked at um, those qualifying populations, which is in homeless individuals and families, and um, at-risk populations, which are those who might be facing eviction or be in unstable housing situations. We compared um, those counts to the supply of transitional and supportive housing, as well as affordable housing in the community. For public comment, um, the housing division, Corey and her staff, did a lot, had a lot of emails and phone calls, Zoom meetings, in-person meetings, and a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings to fulfill that requirement. This is a list of the organizations we, we spoke to, pretty much all of the organizations in Topeka that, that touch homelessness in some way or housing, uh, extremely and affordable housing in some way. And then some of the key takeaways. We had some really great conversations. The organizations here are doing very good and, and in some cases, innovative work from what we see in other communities to serve this population. And with more resources such as this, they can do more. But some of the top items we heard was that we need more units. And almost every um, individual we spoke with said the most critical need was this safe places for homeless people and families to, to lay their head, be it affordable housing units or those um, emergency shelter beds, the non congregant beds we talked about earlier. We also heard about the need for more supportive and mental health services, um, housing for victims of domestic abuse, and you know, supportive services that is trauma-informed because a lot of individuals are coming from very difficult situations to need that support. And also the need for caseworkers for that long-term support that really does help homeless individuals um, become more stable and have uh, or stable lives. So from the needs and gaps analysis, which we looked at the point in time counts, we looked at the HMIS data, which keeps track of who is receiving services from the various organizations. We looked at the supply of shelter beds, housing units, um, affordable housing, uh, et cetera. We looked at the 2020 housing study. Uh, we think there's a need currently for about 20 units or 40 beds for families. Um, so not just an individual bed, but a, a room or unit that can accommodate, accommodate that situation. 30 units or so for adults, or 45 beds, and then four to 500 affordable housing units um, that, that people can move into as they're transitioning into stability. And the overall recommendations for the use of these funds uh, about $1 million for acquisition and development of non-congregate shelters, a little over $750,000 for affordable rental housing, and we want to iterate that with su permanent supportive services that help um, people navigate the housing market and, and keep their commitments, and then program administration. So there's a few caveats here, like how did we come up with those numbers, um, non-congregate Housing, you know, is kind of expensive to acquire, particularly in today's market. So there's some, some market considerations and cost considerations for, you know, a goal of up to 20 units of that type of housing. Um, for affordable rental housing units, we hope that applicants would leverage other programs, um, such as tax credits, the home, home funds, and other funds the city has to leverage these funds as much as possible to provide more um, units for individuals in the city. And program administration, um, this, this money, if it's not used by the city, can be reallocated to these different categories, um, but it's an earmark that HUD allows to make sure the funds are, are administered correctly. And also, for instance, if 
on number one, if $900,000 goes to a proposal, for instance, for a non-congregate shelter, that other $100,000 can be reallocated without redoing this plan to affordable housing units. So there's some flexibility based on what, what comes in in the proposals to the city um, that allows for, for that you know, adjustment over time as, as projects come to light. And just a couple other comments that are kind of, you know, why aren't supportive services in here? We encourage service providers to apply for the $10 million in ARPA funds that, that you all allocated to, to social services in the city. We think that's a, a really good way for these funds to help get those units that all the providers said we need and you all need in the city. And the overall goal is to fund about 20 non-congregated shelter units and 20 affordable supportive housing units. And this would be um, likely funding with other sources as well, but it allows the city to meet some of its affordable housing goals and get these much, much needed units um, in the market um, sooner than, than you would without these funds. So with that, um, those are what, that's what we did in our recommendations. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, I've got a few. Define acquisition. I mean, who is making the, so we get this million dollars, who is acquiring these shelters, these non-congregate shelters? The city, are we purchasing them? Are we allocating the money to other groups to acquire them? Are they groups we've talked to who have said they already have them? I mean, what, how are we physically getting these properties? Um, that is an excellent question. The funds will be made available um, through an RFP process for providers <coughs> to apply for the funds to purchase a non-congregate shelter beds or, or construct or develop. That's how that works. And, and is this one-time money? Or this is one-time money. Okay, so once they purchase it, they're going to have to understand that they got to pay for it moving forward, right? And, and I'm not opposed to this, but, I mean, there's a lot of logistical <laughs> hurdles here I want to make sure we've covered, uh, you know, mm -hmm. if we're going to take on this task of, of allocating this. Because, obviously, once they acquire those or come to agreements, someone's got to pay for the continuing mm -hmm. maintenance and upkeep and, and ownership of those, those uh, properties. Um, because the same would go, I'm assuming, once they're acquired... There's some funds then that have to be made available to put people into those, correct? I mean, are they making a promise to us that once they've acquired them, they will reserve those 20 units in for whatever, as long as they can for people that we direct or who have, that their program directs to, the, to, the, to that program? Or can they flip it on us and say, thanks, we've acquired it, a year goes by, we're done. But we use the federal money to buy it. Um, the city can put in those provisions to ensure kind of long, that this is a long-term um, shelter. Right. And um, so that is, that is a requirement that can be put in place. Okay. I am not sure if, if HUD has that requirement. They do in a lot of their programs. Sure, sure. I just want to make sure we're protecting yeah. ourselves. And I, Absolutely. And most of these groups aren't going to do that, and I'm yeah. not... But I always say we got to worry about the, you know, if we're really going to spend it and, and utilize it. Um, same with the 309000 for program administration. I assume that's the one time to get it through. We're not mm -hmm. talking about a, then having to continue to, we hope we're, we're going to have to budget $300,000 in subsequent years to fund the program. Do my, we know? My understanding is that it should be one time. Um, HUD is still issuing almost weekly FAQs sure. about the program as um, cities are figuring out the, the allocation plans. Yeah. So there is still some gray area, but these are, are great questions. And but, um, but those funds are meant to help the city establish the program, administer the funds, and then move on. And then I guess the last thing, and this isn't really towards you, but as I always tell people, you're the guy who's standing up there at the moment. But everyone can listen. I don't actually appreciate that we have recommended to service providers that these are the types of programs they should apply, be applying for our $10 million in ARP funds. Not because it may not be appropriate, 
But I worry about our staff giving that direction when this council has yet to even come up with guidelines, direction up to where we are going to allocate those funds. And I do not want to give any, and we have been so careful, and I will speak on it during announcements tonight where we are in that process. We've been so careful not to give false hope to anyone yet at this point in the process that I just encourage or discourage any of our staff or any of us to, to encourage groups when we have not quite established the guidelines for what that $10 million is going to go to. So that's just my friendly warning uh, to, to everybody. Like I said, you're the guy standing there, so you, it's, mm -hmm. it's, I look at you, but it's, it's, a, it's a group message to everybody. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Further questions? Councilman Miller. Thank you. Um, just one. You said that the 309000 is flexible, so if, in fact, there was a decision to have someone, particularly that first year, to help transition and, and get things set up that was working with homeless individuals, that would be a possibility. Is that correct? I'm not, not positive or you know guidance on that particular topic. So that particular line item is for administration for the, the grantee, which would be the city. Um, we don't have any idea if we'll, we'll use all those funds. And so that's why um, Andy expressed that we can move those funds to the other two line items that we have funding in. Yeah, I, I guess I was having a hard time figuring out why we would need that much money, either just to keep the books yeah. on it or let somebody else build a property, which I thought was the money in the first two line right. build or rehab. Right. So again, um, we, we put in the 15% because that's what HUD um, gives us um, for administration. We do use that in our other programs. Anytime we're working on this grant, we have to charge to that grant. So we, at this point, we just don't know how much we're going to be working on that grant. We have to do RFPs. We have to monitor the sites. Um, uh, at, you know, if we do a non-congregate shelter, we have to verify that those people coming into that shelter are, in fact, at risk, homeless, or experiencing domestic violence. So there's some monitoring. Um, even with the affordable housing, there's 10-year affordability periods. So we'll be using that funds over a year's time. It is a one-time fund, but we will use it more than just a year. Um, so anytime we're doing those activities, we would have to charge to that particular grant. I, I guess to Spencer's point earlier, you, you know, it, if we're going to set up these kinds of shelters, they're going to need staff in perpetuity Ex exactly. um, and a system. And if, if we're going to bid it out and somebody else is taking responsibility to assure us that they can either accept mm -hmm. or develop this property and that they've, I, I would assume in, in our... RFP, we would be asking them to demonstrate that they can do that Absolutely. long term. I'm already working on um, an RFP, just glancing at other communities already. I'm kind of big on cheating, if you, <laughs> if you call it that. But um, there's, some, there's some great ones out there. And mm -hmm. project capacity, the, the, the ableness to, to continue the program without our help, is definitely going to be a scoring factor in the RFP. So that will be covered. That's good. I'm not privy to what the committee has covered at this point for policy and finance, but I do know that the, that the commitment, to echo Deputy Mayor's comments, the commitment um, has seemed fairly unanimous from the council at, at, when we talked about it back in January, that any of those dollars would be strategic investments for the future and not operating funds. And mm -hmm. so um, I, I would echo his precaution on that one, again, without without knowing any more. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Valdivia-Akala. Thank you, Mayor. Three things. One, I want to totally agree with uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Duncan in that uh, being on the Policy and Finance Committee, I can tell you myself, and I can't imagine what Spencer, you know, and, and Hannah have had, and Councilwoman Nager have had to feel but I have filled in any number of emails wanting to know where we are at and staying by the book on that, you know, we have to wait until it's time for our next meeting 
going by the process that we've all set up, that you know, we don't have anything formalized yet. And so it is inappropriate, uh, even though I'm sure it was not, um, you know, there was not any malice involved, it's inappropriate that staff be taking uh, this type of latitude because to me, what it does is at such a critical point in time, it diminishes what this um, committee is trying to do. So uh, additionally, with the monies that we're talking about, the, these extra funds, we have been talking about in the, the initial stages looking seriously or perhaps not seriously at the Built for Zero program. So my question is, has anybody uh, in Corey's department, Corey, you or anyone looked into if these dollars may be used, HUD dollars, if the Built for Zero program is implemented? So the, um, the HUD dollars, unless we do another amendment to the con plan, which is an option uh, down the road, the HUD dollars would have to be spent on the three line items, only on the line items that we put funding in. So the, uh, the support services, for example, we don't have any funding there. We would not be able to throw money in there later without doing an amendment to the con plan. So the program that you're referring to, uh, Councilwoman Valdivia Alcala, I'm not too familiar with. Um, can you explain it briefly? Um, no. Okay. I mean, I've been talking about it. Uh, city manager is supposed to be working on some things. Uh, I can certainly share the information with you after this meeting, um, but it's it's rather lengthy to that, go into. I, but what I do I do want to say about this though is that whether there is anything known by your staff or not about the Built for Zero program, and I, I'm sorry that you don't, but you know, I can key you in you know, afterwards. The bottom line is, is that when it comes to the chronic unsheltered population, which I'm specifically talking about right now, we have to be looking at the not going back to redundancies that are not really addressing the problem. And what I believe is that the Built for Zero program is a proven program. Again, I can share more with you later. I don't want to take up more time on this. But it's a program that is proven to greatly reduce the amount of chronic unsheltered homeless, which we know is at crisis level in the city right now. I look Thank forward you, to Mayor. hearing about it then. Mm -hmm. Councilman Emerson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I guess a, a question on that. Um, uh, Ms. Wright talked about there's three line items right now. Is that the recommendation shown on slide eight here? That's the one million for acquisition, development of non-congregate congregate shelters. And then I, I, guess, I guess my question is if we want to look at doing something different with this money, we haven't yet amended it, right? So those things can be changed now. Is that correct? So we have went through the 30-day uh, public comment period tonight. We were we were tentatively going to set the um, public hearing uh, for next week. Um, there's still opportunity to change if the body so chooses. Um, but yeah, that's the recommendation. Okay, and and, and I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, I um, a lot of what uh, Councilwoman Valdiviacula has said. I. I agree with that, you know, and, and th these are not bad things at all, but it's treating the symptoms of homelessness, right? It's not treating the causes. And I would love to figure out some way to start um, treating the causes. And, and, and I know there's, there's a particular, I will say there's a particular thing in here, domestic abuse that I'm 100% great with having plenty of room for people to get out of domestic abuse. But to the extent there's other things, um, if there's a way we can start um, cutting down on the actual causes of homelessness, I, I would sure rather do that. Because again, long term, I mean, we could build, you know, 100,000 beds, right? And eventually, you know, if we, uh, you know, at some point people start coming here just to, you know, to because we're, we're a place that can take them. And uh, I mean, you know, thank God I'm not homeless. So it's, it's not a judgment on them, but it's... <coughs> It's simply if there's a way to get people out of home, if there's a way to solve it, and if um, Bill for Zero, uh, the councilwoman talked about that, I guess our last meeting, which is a couple weeks ago now, and it, it looks like a great program. There's um, 
there's a number of communities that have done it. Uh, they're kind of our similar, similar demographics, I would say. So I would, I would love to see if there's a way to do that. Again, these are, these are good things, and, and they're, I don't think anyone has any uh, malintent here. It's just I would love if there's a way to fix causes mm -hmm. rather than treat the symptoms. That, that would be my, my bias, I guess, my, yeah. my want. Um, Councilmember Emerson, um, HUD has really um, pushed housing first model uh, for the past several years and we actually use a portion of our shelter plus care for housing first and so housing first is essentially putting them into housing and then trying to address all the problems that got them into that situation so I mean as you can understand you're not going to worry about your mental health if you have no roof over your head um, examples like that so um, I think that was part of the conversation uh, when we met with some people as is housing first so but I understand that that program sounds great as well yeah thank you mm -hmm. uh, deputy mayor what is the status of impact avenues at this point today and can any of these funds be used for that program um, great question it's doing wonderful and I'd be happy if if you so choose to do a report for you guys um, about the success we're getting ready to wrap up that third year so um, with that, we um, have some money left over. We uh, negotiated with our funder, Advisors Excel, and they agreed to allow, let us use that money to keep our staff that we have and have the money for the families uh, for another year. So it's funded for another year. Okay, yeah, because last I heard, June was a yeah June was a scary yes. tipping point, and so I know we'll talk about that through some other programs. I called staff many times and said, you've got to find money for this program. Yes. We cannot let this thing die. But they, they so at least we bought ourselves a year. But yeah, do we know if any of this would qualify for that program? So it would probably qualify. It would qualify under support services. However, once you open support services up, then you have multiple agencies, somewhat like our social service programs, where then we would have to put a cap and and you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars isn't going to fund uh, impact avenues for any length of time. Right. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I agree. I think uh, a, uh, an update report on impact avenues would be appreciated by the body. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. Happy to do so. Councilman Cal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so you're talking how HUD kind of wants to go with the put someone in, then fix the problem. So with the idea to have separate locations for the for these beds, because when you're dealing with different issues, you're, you're, you may just have a family that's out of work, and now you're putting them in a situation that may be a dangerous situation. And yes. so is there the plan to maybe have like four different sets separated so you can deal with each one of those problems? Because I believe that our traditional, most of our traditional home shelters don't, don't take care like they should in the aspect of, like you said, how are you supposed to get a bed if you're on illegal drugs and you need to get help? Well, it's one of those things of you can't get the help until you get clean and you're not going to get clean until you get the help. So right. it's a revolving door mm -hmm. situation. So what my fear is is you get too many people uh, from those different subsets can cause a, a very volatile situation. and may not solve anything for anyone. Uh, Council Member Kell, I completely agree, uh, which is why that recommendation is 20, 20 units. Um, not, not too many people, but still a lot when they have multiple um, issues to, to be addressed. Um, when we do the RFP, the staff capacity uh, of the agency that receives the funds will be considered in the scoring process. So if they have a staff member on site, for example, um, that's 24 hours on site, um, then that would be a scoring item on the RFP uh, when we're considering where the money goes. So that would hopefully try to alleviate um, some of those problems you addressed. And then with just, I know you talk about RFPs, but would there just be things like, uh, which one thing I'm very familiar with as a veteran working at the VA, you know, that's, that's a free service that we're not having to pay out to have someone come, mm -hmm. uh, with, are, are you looking at organizations like that to also help maybe st stretch those dollars that you do have to try to get things going in the right direction on, on that? Exactly. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Okay. Um, we're trying to find an agency 
that has support services that we can add the housing to. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So we'll provide the housing, we'll help acquire the housing, and then you, agency, provide those support services to help get them on their feet. Thank you. Thank you yep. Further questions? Mayor. Councilwoman Hiller. Uh, not a question so much as, um, I guess I can frame it as a question. Hearing the input and the interest on the part of this council, if, if you know, maybe next week, I think it was supposed to be for a vote, if we're not ready, but the council wants to be more educated, maybe something that would even kind of lay out in a chart form or something just profile built for zero housing first impact avenues and perhaps mr. Burton's program if it's different than those just so we can kind of see and see where these in perhaps the dollars as you have them laid out could go to any of those models I'm not sure but it would it would help us kind of have an idea about how those models serve still with with your proposal for money Anything further? Thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Is is that what the body wishes then to go ahead and come back with the uh, different the various models from different agencies? Well, that's a suggestion from Councilwoman Hiller. I don't know that that'll give you enough time to uh, get enough information about the Built from Zero uh, program to adequately compare it. But if you feel that you can provide that, uh, it's certain, more information doesn't hurt. Okay, sounds good. Thank you again. Okay, we move on now to non action item 6B. If the clerk would read. B is discussion of the proposed 2023 to 2032 CIP and 2023 to 2025 CIB. Mr. Sam Manager. Mayor, Governor Body, tonight we continue our discussion on the uh, CIP budget. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Steve Wade, Finance Director. On last week, we submitted uh, for your examination a list of changes that we have gathered from council members over these last several weeks during discussions. Uh, there are a couple of changes that are additions to that list that I would like to make tonight. Um, first is just a notation that on parking facility repairs, uh, the money has been moved from cash payments to taxable geo bonds. This is one of the conversations we had very early in the, in the process. The parking fund is not able to support cash payments, and so that moves the $7 million to taxable, ge taxable geo bonds. Council Member Hiller had asked us to consider um, pausing some programs, and I wanted to note that the Fix Our Streets portion of those, that money stays in the CIP, it just moves to 2018. So the money doesn't disappear, the funding just rolls into 2018. 2018. I'm sorry, 2028. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm off a decade. Okay. <laughs> You know, 2028, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and then um, the uh, engineering department would like to request that Tyler, uh, phase two, which is Northwest Tyler, Paramore to Beverly, be accelerated one year. It's currently in the CIB. It's just moving it from 24 and 25 to 23 and 24. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I'd stand for any questions. Okay. Questions from the body for Mr. Wade? Deputy Mayor. So does that change with the parking dollars impact any of any timelines or how we can spend it or when we can spend it or slow down anything, speed up anything? I don't know. Is it, it, it actually accelerates the ability to spend money. The, the way it was laid out in cash was a million dollars a year. Uh, that does not allow you to make any immediate repairs. By moving it to geo bonds, um, we've actually acceler accelerated that money up into, um, I think it's 23 and 25. 
Thank you. Hmm? Further questions for Mr. Wang? Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in that parking fund with the movement from cash to bonding, is the expectation with that that the debt service would be paid out of the parking fund at this point by the time it's due? Honestly, Councilwoman, I'm not sure the parking fund can support the debt service. That's important for us to know. Uh, as our current revenue streams run right now, it would be questionable that it could support the debt service. Well, they're way down. Yes, ma'am. Right. There was going to be some review of the parking plan and, and adjusted revenue projections and so on. Has that happened yet? Uh, we have, I, th I think, um, a couple of months ago, shared a, a list of revenue uh, by garage. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, city manager, that there's been any update since that point in time. We have a meeting coming up um, next week to discuss overall parking for downtown. And so it'll be to regroup as to what we want to do and our, or what our recommendations will be on parking. Um, so that's, uh, as we know, revenue on parking all the way around is down. And uh, it currently is the way it stands. Uh, cannot financially stay, stand solvent as it is. And so um, we will be bringing recommendations to the governing body, but uh, at that point, we, we, the governing body and we will need to make a decision as to how we want to proceed with some of the debt service as far as uh, the overall parking garages. Mr. Wade, do you have something? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I want to make sure I didn't misspeak on the on your question as far as debt service. I don't believe the parking fund can support the debt service, but certainly the, the GO fund or the general fund uh, would be the backstop on that one. So we we are we would be pledging our full faith and credit. Understand that. Um, overall, there's you all have done such tremendous work, and I appreciate the updates as well. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I'm trying to then put put back together the kind of thought process we've used before in terms of how much revenue is coming in and how much we would be obligating ourselves for. Um, if I missed it, forgive me, but it would be real helpful to me to see, for instance, we have a 25 or 27 million three-year bond cap right now. Um, that's not in those budget forms so that you can see what, what the budget would allow and what we're actually, what the current proposal is to spend. I think we're over, but I'm not sure. And it would just be real helpful to be able to see that. With the um, allocation of the roughly $36 million of ARPA money, we're actually below that cap. Well, that was my next question because I remember the discussion when we decided on the ARPA money mm -hmm. that it was going to get us way below those caps for way below, like knock it out entirely so that we didn't bond in those early years and ultimately didn't have to bond anything for four years and we were going to save, if I recall correctly, for the city budget roughly $8 million dollars. But other projects have been added in, and so I was wanting to know where we are with that before we vote. I apologize. Where we are with what? Well, when when we ha when we made the ARPA decision and voted, correct me if I'm wrong, voted to commit 35.6 million of the ARPA money to the CIP. The idea, as I recall was to offset pretty much 100% or the equivalent of 100% of the CIP cap, the normal amount that we would bond for four years, um, thereby saving us you know, paying down bonds and not adding new ones and, and saving, I think your number was $8 million that would lower the city's <coughs> budget so that we could afford to do more in the future. It was, my recollection is it was about $36 million out of 55. 
over a five-year time period that we had that we were looking at at the time. Okay. Um, and since that point in time, the the parking fund is new to the request. But there were some building, like city hall projects and so on as well, that were big ticket items that were added also. Uh, the HVAC system, yes, ma'am. Um, and then there's um, the fleet garage. Right. Well, I'd, I'd like to be able to reconcile that. And if, if I'm the only person that's interested, maybe I just need to sit down with it. But, you know, with that savings that we thought we were going to get, if that was 35.6, but we've added back 10 plus, whatever, 13 for the HVAC for City Hall, and the, no, it's more than that. It'd be more like 16 added back in. And then if we're talking parking garages as well, what's the net on that in terms of whether we're below our, whether we're saving anything? If, if I would appreciate that. Mr. Wade, can you accommodate Councilwoman Hiller and uh, have a meeting outside of this meeting to go into more detail that will uh, answer some of the questions that she has? Yes, sir. It's, we added about $24 million uh, from the original set. Added back? Yes, ma'am. So, it's, it's Deputy Mayor? Uh, two things. One, I had a separate comment, but I'll just real quick. I mean, I, I will say my recollection was not that it was a complete, that we never talked about it being a complete offset. I do remember us talking about using as much as we could to offset, but then also looking at projects we then would not have to additionally take on new debt for that would give us the freedom to, to free it up. And there is a distinction there, obviously, but th that's just my part of my recollection. Um, but my real comment was back. I, am, I know that in the sometime soon future, we will have a very lively and robust conversation about what recommendations may or may not be coming from our infrastructure committee regarding those parking garages. But tonight in front of us is the fact that we own all seven garages and we're looking at allocating these funds, which, which I do believe needs to happen as of right now while we own them. I, my question relates to that is, have we at least done assessments on as we make any improvements as to what changes we need to make in not just how we manage them, but what we're charging for those garages so that we don't end up back here again moving forward. What the, what the fees would be, how we're going to fund the, that program, how we're going to make sure that we're charging appropriately, holding former lease holders who didn't do their job for many years <coughs> accountable if they are responsible for maintenance. I mean, I mean, I, I can sit here and eat the debt to some degree. It pains me and we can work through it. What I don't want is 10 years from now, this body having the same conversation because we made the same mistakes moving forward. So I just, I'm a, have we looked at any of what that means once the money's spent? <clears throat> We've had several conversations and uh, some of them have been um, excited by certain individuals that uh, what the cost is gonna be for parking how much meter parking is, how much garage parking is, and um, we are in a very interesting position right now in the aspect that um, there's a large push to not charge for parking at all from a lot of individuals, which is something that cannot be sustained by the city if we are going to um, maintain parking garages and even horizontal parking as far as that goes. Um, that conversation, as you know, will be coming back up. Part of it is the bagged meters. That comes back up in front of the governing body here uh, very soon, whether we put the keep, remain to keep the bags on the meters and not charge people to park, or we take them off. Um, and so um, I do not think, and this is speculation on my part, that there is the appetite from the community to pay what needs to be paid to maintain parking in the parking garages and horizontal parking meters. And so that's conversation again that needs to be had uh, when we have this meeting in a couple of weeks. Well, yeah, then I would just say when, when that does come before us, I think we need to see those numbers. 
a realistic number of this is the monthly fee that people pay this now. It would, in an ideal world, it's this, and then we have a reference point because otherwise we're just sort of grabbing the ceiling. So, like I said, I know that will be a future lively discussion, but I just didn't know if we some of those had been connected to this specific discussion of, of the dollars. So, thank you. Back on that, I mean, I represent downtown and I was here through that parking study. Maybe it just depends on who's talking to who, but uh, since that conversation went public, 100% of the emails I've gotten have been, we need to hang on to the parking garages. Um, I do think the reason I asked if the study was updated was because the study was, it was pretty easy to read and was very thoughtful in terms of saying, if you're going to fix up your garages, it's going to cost this much, and these are the kinds of fees that you would need to charge. I cannot remember whether what whether that also said, and here's here's six comparable cities and what what the charges are for meters and for parking garages, but we were very comparable, and it was just sort of like sticker shock. We want to be a big city downtown, and we want to develop all these things. Big city downtowns charge for parking. Um, that, and, and, and so it's a, it's a learning curve to understand this is how this system works. And I wonder if even if the study itself hasn't been updated, and certainly we, we lost all that parking in the garages and on the street with COVID, so a, a tremendous setback. But, but maybe if, if people could even be sent copies of that study, somewhat outdated as it is, but it does walk you through what you have to do to figure out the rates and, and how it works. So it, we, we did have it, and I'm sure it's been hard to do projections uh, uh, and update it, but we have a framework to work from. So. Councilman Emerson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, and I guess res in response, uh, Deputy Mayor, to that, um, being on the inf infrastructure committee, and having just gone on the Northwest Arkansas trip, it's, it's my uh, hope that we can get the Walton family to buy those garages. <laughs> <laughs> because what I found is every check, the minimum check they'll write is about $100 million. So, and I will tell you for $100 million, I would sell all seven garages. But anyway, They've got three just so if anyone's meeting the parameters of what I'm looking for. We learned they have three billionaires down there. We just got to attract one. That's right. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, a serious question, and it's, and it's off of the, the parking for right now, but, um, and I don't mean to steal any thunder from Councilwoman Hiller on this, but um, we did talk earlier today, and one of the concerns is I, I, I hate to zero out the pavement maintenance for next year, and, and in talking to some people in the, in the industry, uh, some engineers and contractors both, they believe there will be plenty of capacity next year to do some of that. Um, so I, I, I totally, I, I totally understand uh, the reason why that was um, that was an attempt to try to actually take pressure off people. Uh, but what I'm hearing is is there's the capacity, and people are kind of worried there actually won't be enough next year to do if if we pause that program right now. I, I think there are some of those concerns, Councilman, and honestly, I think it's the hope of the public works director and myself and the city manager that we come back to you in December or January uh, with a request to append the CIP because we've gotten so much done that we need, we need more money. So I, I think that is our hope is that we will make more progress. And, uh, and, and I'm sorry, I'm catching you cold on this because we, we talked earlier today, right. but the clock, I got the clock ran out on me. Sure. Um, and uh, I, had a, I had a conversation uh, like around 5 o'clock tonight, and... Um, it was basically about the timing, because I, I mentioned that. I said, hey, I, you know, I think we have a, a sensible solution here. The issue is to have projects ready to start in March or April, you need to be bidding them in, in November or December. So they really need to know, you know, I don't know, August? Sure. Uh, or so if there's going to be this, this because that's what, you'll get your best prices then. If you wait till you know, KDOT's going to start bidding stuff, and then, People are going to get full, and then you'll have, you know, we're down to two asphalt companies really here now, and they're going to get busy on the turnpike, or and then we're bidding something in, in, in April or May or June, and the price is going to be 2x, or there may be only be one bidder on stuff, and it's not a, 
it's not a thing you want to be in. Plus, I, th I know our citizens would like as soon, or I, I believe our citizens would like as soon as the weather, you know, the asphalt plants can open in, in April when it gets warm enough, they want, they want to start seeing progress on the roads. So that's, I guess that's my pitch for not waiting until then. Um, I totally understand the reasoning. And, um, but as this person pointed out to me, hey, we need to know because we need to be bidding the stuff in. You know, the city needs to be bidding it in no later than maybe December to get started in March or April. So that's my pitch on that. Understood. Thank you. Yes, sir. Are there questions, comments, Mr. Wade? Okay. Thank you all for your input. Um, thank you, Steve, for the work you're doing and updating us as you usually do. I think that helps us in advance. Thank you, sir. Uh, we move on now to uh, public comment. And I have one person signed up for public comment. Uh, Russell Burton. Good evening, Senator Council. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate it very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Russell Burton. Um, I've been running the streets with the homeless for the last three plus years. Um, I have an intimate relationship with folks on the home, uh, on the streets that are homeless, chronically homeless with seriously mental illness. Um, I want to congratulate the city on being concerned about taking action about public health measures amongst the homeless. I, I agree with you guys and I support you guys. As a social scientist and a psychologist with, with a PhD and a clinical social work degree, I deep down believe you guys really do care about the chronically homeless in your community for a variety of reasons. Um, they're human beings from our community and they're our community's responsibility. Um, we need to do the best we can to help them maintain their, their, their public health in their camps, and I, and I do support your efforts. Um, but you know what I know? I know we're not doing the best we can as Topekans and Kansans, and, 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 I'll, and, and I'll tell you why. Because I know that three years ago, we all got together, and the city adopted Housing First with Shelter Plus Care. We went down to the river, my organization, completely 100% voluntary, went down to the river. We cleaned out the river. You guys did it with bulldozers this time. We cleaned out the river encampment. We did it the right way. We, we brought housing first down there with shelter plus care. I can tell you right now, 75% of those individuals remain housed today. And those were individuals who had burned every relationship in this community they possibly could. They were no way they were going to deal with Vallejo or Vallejo wasn't going to deal with them. There were no way they were going to deal with the mission or the mission was going to be able to deal with them. We brought them off the streets and they remain off the streets. You guys know what works. You guys did it three years ago. You cleaned out the river the proper way. You did it the right way. It works, guys. So this is housing first with shelter plus care. The city already provides shelter plus care. It provides about 350 uh, individual units that the city pays for through federal government funding. That program needs to be somewhere increased by 50% to 100% by my uh, estimates on the chronically homeless individuals that you have on the streets that have serious mental illness. If you guys do that, you also need to increase affordable housing in your community, accommodating affordable housing. We're talking about people that don't have IDs, that don't have social security cards, that don't have any rental history, any, any credit history, may have evictions, but they still need housing. They still need to be housed. You guys need affordable, accommodating housing in your community. Um, you guys need housing first. Um, let me see if I can catch up with my notes. Um, we house approximately a quarter of the individuals, our organization through Housing First, that this city houses of the 350 people. It would cost you guys $150,000 to fund what we do on an annual basis. You could bring off 100 chronically homeless, individually mentally ill individuals off the streets a year. It would cost you $150,000. It would save, based on general estimates, about half a million dollars. I believe that's 330% dollar on your investment. Housing First works. It's been demonstrated nationally, internationally. Your, the other program that we're talking about here, uh, 
build for zero. I don't know much about it. It's in about 90 communities in the United States. Housing First has been everywhere around the world, and it works. It's cheap, it's easy, and the federal government pays for it, guys. Dr. Burton, would you like some more time? Um, I would love to answer any questions you have. I know a whole, I can talk to you about a chronic underclass homelessness that you have in your streets. If you'd like to hear, I, I, I can ask a lot, answer a lot of questions, I hope. Well, there's a big time for your presentation, not a give and take okay, question yeah. and answer. I'm sure, so there is a chronic underclass homeless in your, in your community. Would if, you like two more minutes? Please, sir, thank you. Mayor, so move two minutes. Okay. Thank Motion you, sir. to allow two more minutes to Councilman Emerson. Second by Councilwoman Hiller. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. So you, you, your, your, your chronic street homelessness situation, the people that are in the, the doorways of your businesses and that you see downtown, these are folks who are an underclass in your homeless community. They don't have relationship with anybody for a variety of reasons. One of the primary reasons is we're talking about serious behavioral health problems personality disorders that prevent people from establishing relationships. When they get a close relationship with somebody, they blow it up. They're terrified of those things. These are the people that, that schizophrenia, things that prevent people from being in the mission. Can you imagine being molested as a child by men and then having to go sleep on the mission floor around a bunch of men? There's a variety of reasons in which the mission's not accommodatable for these folks. And they're left on the streets. They're, they're, they're left unattended by our community. Our organization is taking it upon our, ourselves just simply because we've seen the need to, 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 to come into the community. And, and, and we went to Corey and offered her housing first for the first time in this community. We've practiced it for three years. 75% of our individuals remain housed. That's probably as good as Vallejo, if not better, and nothing against Vallejo. But our program works. It, it, it works, guys. This is where your money needs to go. This is where your effort needs to go. It, 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 it's, not really, it's not really all that complicated. Fund housing first. You can do it for, for $150,000. You guys can get 330% return on your investment. Your business members, your, they'll be thrilled to death. Your actual prevalence of homelessness on the street will be very, very small. Your incidents will be of a rate, but hopefully the program can handle it. But the people that you see regularly on the streets, they'll be housed permanently. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Burton. I appreciate your time very much. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, no one else has signed up for public comment. We'll move on to announcements. Uh, Madam Clerk. Okay, for the May 10th agenda, we have, <coughs> excuse me, two proclamations, Community Action Month and Letter Carriers Stamp Out Hunger Food Drive. We have three appointments. We have on the consent agenda, we have two special event resolutions, two noise resolutions. Uh, on the action items, we'll have approval of the uh, 2020 Consolidated Action Plan Amendment. We have a resolution for the 2022 citywide half cent sales tax projects from the Public Infrastructure Committee. We have a resolution for the CIP and then the corresponding utilities revenue bond resolution. And then the Policy and Finance Committee report on the ARPA application process, an update. Uh, Non-action items uh, include a uh, discussion on KDOT Highway I-70 improvements for land donation, downtown comprehensive parking plan update, and then, uh, of course, city manager recruitment process. Thank you. City manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, what I have is really just I uh, want to make an announcement. Uh, uh, the city of Topeka will be hold, holding a register and bid with the city of Topeka virtual workshop this Saturday from 9 to 11. This is an effort to increase um, small businesses registering with City Topeka to be able to bid on city projects, provide information. Uh, it'll help them create a, an account so they can be in the bidding process, how to respond to bids, modify existing bids, where to go see if they want to bid, and they can register by email, uh, procurement at Topeka.org. And upon uh, registering, you will be provided with a Zoom meeting details. So. I just wanted to 
let everybody know that this is an effort by the city of Topeka to increase um, small businesses to register with city to be. Thank you. I imagine that information will be on city four. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, Councilwoman Ortiz. I don't have anything. <coughs> okay. Other you. than to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. I'll say that. Thank you. Councilman Emerson. Uh, probably the only thing, uh, Mayor, is that this Friday is the city track meet. Once again, I will not be running in it, <laughs> but I'll have two high school juniors in it, and uh, it's it's a great time to you know come out and, and see all the teams from around the city. Great, Councilman Kim. Um, today is National Teacher Day. Um, my wife's a teacher. My mother-in-law is a retired, semi-retired teacher because she's substituting full time now. Um, my sister was a teacher. I actually went to school to be a teacher until some laws came and enacted that deterred me from wanting to become a teacher. Um, and that's some of the struggles teachers have to deal with. Uh, the law I'm talking about in Kansas is where they're going to, you could be punished for teaching what the state said you're allowed to teach. So I was like, okay, as a sociology history major, I wasn't sure if I really wanted to go down that route and, and get in trouble for doing my job. But uh, teachers in that change, uh, teachers stay with you your whole life. Uh, I have a former teacher, former principal that from Lovenworth is now here in, at Topeka High and Rebecca Morrissey, and she is still the voice inside my head uh, mm -hmm. when things sometimes get frantic or I'm not sure what to do. I usually hear her voice or another teacher's voice that, you know, calm down, wait, think about it, then react kind of situation. So... Uh, I, I greatly appreciated her, and I've always spoken her highly of her to her students that she has now uh, because of what impact she had on my life. Um, teachers do a lot with little. Uh, they have laws ch changed that can hurt uh, their budgets. They have budget cuts. They have larger class sizes. Uh, there's a lot of stress that goes on, on with teaching, and a lot of people believe it's just a eight to five job and you have your summers off and everything's hunky dory. Uh, as, a, as a husband of a teacher, that is definitely not true. Um, and there's several ways to honor your teachers. Uh, you can ask if they have a wish list. Uh, a lot of teachers have, have ideas and things and they're, they're trying not to fund themselves because it just gets really expensive to be a teacher. Uh, gift cards, especially for Amazon, Dollar Tree, I should have bought a Dollar Tree franchise a long time ago. I would have saved a lot of money. And about this time of year, alcohol. Teachers love it. Uh, uh, it uh, this year, probably you get stressful on a teacher. So uh, uh, just make sure you look out for your teachers. Uh, and and as, as you grow and remember the teachers you had um, and how much they affected your life. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Are you going to share that gift? Well, share the drink, so I usually give it to you. Uh, okay. Um. Councilwoman Nager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to go ahead and congratulate Tammy Martin, a District 6 constituent. This was passed along to me by um, our city attorney, Ms. Stanley. Um, she was named Legal Professional of the Year um, for the state of Kansas. She's a paralegal at the League of Kansas Municipalities, so she knows a lot about what we do on a regular basis. And I wanna make sure that we really elevate the people in our community that are going above and beyond, especially at a level that you are recognized in our entire state. So congratulations to Ms. Martin. I also wanted to go ahead and draw attention to the fact that it is Teacher Appreciation Day and Teacher Appreciation Week. I also come from a family of educators, and what you can go ahead and do right now is go to donorschoose.org. You can find a teacher that you really, really care about who's working on a project. You can put in our area. There are 22 active projects in, our, in the Topeka area. And if you're more in the Shawnee County area and looking at some other schools like Silver Lake and Rossville, you can find people in those areas as well. And right now, 
with it being Teacher Appreciation Day, Sonic is actually matching up to 100, I mean, no, $1.5 million. And so if you are donating to a cause, you can actually exponentially increase what you're giving to those teachers. These are chronically paid individuals chronically underpaid individuals who are going the extra mile to make sure that our kids are well educated, are well nourished, and they need all of the support they can get. So thank you to the teachers out there. Thank you to all of the school professionals as well. And again, donorschoose.org. I already fully funded my sister's project, so you can't fund her. But thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Hiller. Oh, I'm sorry. Deputy Mayor. I did that again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I've got a few things. Um, this Thursday is the Topeka Police Department's annual memorial service, which begins at 9 a.m. I think it'll probably last a couple hours as they travel to the various cemeteries and lay wreaths on our officers who have fallen. Um, that is open to, to anyone. Then at 8 p.m. at the State House, they do the candlelight visual for the statewide officers. Um, so I'd encourage anyone to, to take a look at that. I believe the police department event starts at the LEC uh, at 9 a.m. Uh, I also encourage people, the city manager poll is out there and up and will be up for, I don't know, until the 13th of May, I believe. So uh, I, I, right, I, I strongly advocated to let you do unlimited words in the comments section. <laughs> so please go do that as I get the looks from staff. Oh, yeah, we know, Duncan, we know. But, so you can, besides answering our questions, there is a comment section there for you to actually leave anything you think we have left off of the questions that we're asking. Um, this will be the first Saturday, so I will be doing my office hours at Farallon Plaza. You can come over there from 9 to 11, actually this week, 9 to 10.30 a.m. Sorry, I got to leave a little early, but 9 to 10.30 a.m. Um, over at Farallon Plaza. Um, all right, let me briefly explain the ARPA situation and where we're at with that. You will, it will not be on next week's agenda. Um, we made the mistake of thinking the state of Kansas was going to have their act together and move in an in a efficient and, uh, fashion, and of course, you know, fool me a hundred times. Um, we, we held off because it was our belief that they would make some announcements within the, uh, within the last few weeks. They had targeted end of April. At this point, nobody knows when those announcements will be made as they work through their process. As we've told people, whether individual groups or, or other things get dollars from their funds was not a qualifier for us. But it was going to be additional information to help just guide us through some of our process and decisions. Um, but we don't want to wait forever. As we continue to help people, we, we want to do this in a diligent manner, so, but we also don't want to slow it down to so slow that it takes us forever. Um, so policy and finance is working on scheduling a meeting at the end of this month. If the state has made their announcements by then, great. We will have that information and can factor it in. If they have not, it is our intention to finish up our initial part of the process, have an application to review, and bring that to you in June for discussion so that we can get our process started at some point and not continue to be beholden to the state of Kansas. So, so we are sorry for a little bit of a delay, but we are trying to do our due diligence through this, and so that's kind of where we are at in that timeline for, for everybody. Um, there's a new cookie joint in my district. It is relatively close to my house, Crumble Cookies it is called. It is actually a native Topekan who has opened it. He's, he opened a few up in Kansas City with some investors, and now he's opened this one here in Topeka. Um, I am deathly allergic to egg, so I probably will not be able to partake of the taste. I will go make sure I take, take in the scent and buy lots for my family and my neighbors, so there is a new business there. Everyone should at least go, go check it out. And lastly, if you, if you can, call your mothers this weekend. Thank you very much, Mayor. Councilman Lesser. Uh, real quick, just uh, uh, happy Teacher's Day again. Three, uh, three that really made a difference in my life. Uh, one, the late Sister Mary, uh, Mary Corita, um, uh, Jane Pajabinski, and Daryl J. Herger um, uh, from Assumption Gray School made a, a pretty big impact in me. I do want to apologize for them. I know it could have been easier had Ritalin been available at that point in time, <laughs> but uh, being that it wasn't, um, uh, I do apologize, so, for, but thanks for putting up with me. That's all I got. Thank you. 
Councilman Mahaley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I really appreciate the discussion on the issues today. I just wanted to say that again. Um, I think most of you know that I somehow found my found myself on the task force for uh, helping Ukrainian refugees relocate in Topeka. We have a third family coming on Thursday. Um, they will be in, in a donated apartment in the historic Holiday Park neighborhood. Um, there's been a, a couple of different communication channels, but the public has stepped forward and, and furnished that apartment and the things that they need for their household. Um, USD 501 has responded really positively. Uh, they've got a, a young girl that'll be at Robinson, and it turns out that Principal Leffert there even has a master's in secondary language acquisition. He's so excited about having her. And then two young men that will be at Topeka High, and so we're really excited to have, to have that happening again. Um, and the word's getting out that Topeka is a really welcoming community, so we'll see. Um, and speaking of months and, and weeks and days, this is Asian American Pacific Islander Month. And because of some connections that I end up making through Topeka United, um, the Your View channel of Cox Communications, um, I was able to link them up with Rayhan Reza, who many people know, and he interviewed with them last week. It started airing um, last night. It will air all week, and people also can access the YouTube. Of, of his interview, so one of our local business people has, uh, is getting national exposure and fame for what what happened here. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Valdivia Akala. Thank you, Mayor. A uh, couple of things. One thing, one of the reasons I did not become a teacher was because I didn't want to deal with students like uh, Lesser. <laughs> <laughs> I was a volunteer, room mother, helper, all the way through my kid being in fifth grade, would go in and help with math and everything. And any time a lesser type, I would always have to say extra <laughs> prayers to help me have patience. But as we talk about, you know, teacher appreciation, I just, there's not enough that we can say about teachers and, and what they go through and the stresses that they are under. My sister... Catherine is a master sped teacher at McCarter, and she's always taking money out of her own pocket to continuously give to her kids in the classroom. And she is not the exception. I would say that, that more or less she is the rule. So I wanted to give a shout out to my sister Catherine for being the wonderful teacher she is, and also recognition for Pamela Munoz, who also teaches at McCarter who is a member of Our Lady Guadalupe Church and is also a finalist for Kansas Teacher of the Year. Uh, Pamela is just a wonderful, wonderful kindergarten teacher. So uh, a shout out to, to all of those teachers that educate uh, our children. Um, also wanted to give a big shout out to the, Kans or to the Three Shields Boxing Club. They have come uh, through with two Kansas City Golden Gloves champions. Uh, one is Peyton Sewell, and he is uh, 10 years old in the 70-pound weight. The other one is Halim uh, Ramirez, uh, 15 years old at the 118 pounds weight. Uh, so congratulations to those champions. And last night, the boxing club had 60 kids in attendance for their practice. Um, also, as we're talking about veteran, the veteran memorial that will be uh, put up at Our Lady Guadalupe and hope we get a good turnout there, I do want to acknowledge uh, my father-in-law, who I never knew, uh, Abel Alcala, who was a World War II veteran, and his two brothers, who were also World War II veterans. That would be Jesse Alcala and Joe Alcala. I think that we have a number of veterans within uh, the Mexican-American community uh, from all of the wars, and I definitely believe that they have not received the recognition that is so due to them for their bravery and for their fighting uh, for this country. So that's it. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, and to follow up a little bit, uh, Councilwoman, uh, just so you know, um, I talked with uh, the organizers, uh, Mr. Vasquez, 
and we know that not every serving uh, veteran has had the opportunity to have a family member uh, place a brick on the memorial. Uh, they have purchased additional bricks, so um, those family members can, in fact, if they wish, uh, purchase those bricks so they can be laid at the memorial as well. So that will help uh, some people who didn't know that this effort was going on. So, uh, and I knew uh, both of the gentlemen that you mentioned. Uh, so I think that might be appropriate as well for the family. Um, so I, I, I appreciate your comments on that. Um, Deputy Mayor took my thunder away about the police memorials. So that's off my list. Uh, I would like to mention um, our office, the uh, mayor's office, received notification that there is going to be uh, a christening of a ship, a uh, U.S. naval ship. Uh, we know we have uh, the USS Topeka, uh, but now we will have the USS Frankie Peterson, Jr. Um, Mr. Peterson uh, was a student of Topeka High, not Highland Park, uh, Topeka <laughs> High, and uh, we were able to have a great career in the military. And I think it's an honor that he's going to be uh, recognized in this fashion. The ship will be uh, uh, formed in uh, Pearl Harbor, and that uh, will take place later on this month. Uh, we've received some communications from the, uh, the crew and the captain. I just want to make sure that people know that uh, uh, the beacon is being recognized for their service in a very very significant way by the U.S. Navy. Uh, and, uh, like uh, Councilman Martinez said, it is Mother's Day coming up this weekend. For those of us, like myself, who's very lucky to still have my mother with me, uh, we appreciate it. Talk to her about three or four times a day. Uh, and if I don't, she reminds me. Uh, but for those who have lost their mothers as well, this is an opportunity for us to give time and thought to everything that they have done for us and our families. So happy Mother's Day to everyone there. Um, that's all I have, and we'll move on now. There is a need for an exec two executive sessions this evening. If you can agree. The motion will be to recess into executive session, not to exceed 15 minutes, to discuss employer-employee negotiations relating to the Fraternal <coughs> Order of Police and other unions as may be necessary for the discussion as authorized by KSA 754319B3. The following staff may be needed to assist the governing body in its deliberations. Interim City Manager William Cochran and any other staff he deems necessary. So moved. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. We will take a 10 minute recess and then move into the second session. Gets it yeah. you. Okay. We have reconvened in uh, the meeting and are now back in open session with no action being taken by the governing body uh, and during that session and we have a need to go back into our second section if the city attorney would agree. The motion would be to recess into executive session not to exceed 20 minutes to discuss individual matters related to individual employees pursuant to KSA 754319B1. The open meeting will resume in the city council chambers. The following staff may be needed to assist the governing body in its deliberation. Interim city manager Cochran and any other staff he deems necessary. Okay, we've heard the need for executive session. There's a motion. Second. Motion, motion by Councilman Cow, seconded by Councilman Emerson. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we will adjourn into our second executive session. <coughs> okay. okay, we're coming out of our second executive session. Uh, we've uh, taken no action by the governing body during that session. If there is no further business occurring before the governing body, this meeting is adjourned. Peace.